Let them peer in on you when you're not doing right. <laughs> you're going to shine when they look in. And they do. Now you say, well, if I'm in heaven, I wouldn't want to look down on there. Well, yeah, you would. If you have a, a son or a daughter or somebody you want following God, say amen. Come on, let's be real. Now, it says, being that we are surrounded with such a great uh, uh, witnesses, let us lay, let us, not God, let us lay aside. Everyone say, lay aside. Lay aside. Every weight and sin. So let me describe. A weight is something in your life. Now, please, again, no condemnation meant for you, but to open your mind and ask God for help. Weight in our life are those things that you are doing or having or practicing that really are kind of like a waste of time. Now, we, all of us have that, and we have to ask God to give us the discernment. What is good? And what is just a waste of time? Hello? Look, at, if you can't carpenterize, if you can't put two nails and boards together, I would say that carpentry is not your part day. <laughs> so we need to find out what it is and get after it. Can you say amen? So because of that, we lay aside the weights to keep us from obeying God. And it's not talking about fat or that. It's talking about the things that seem to always get in our way. Are you, no, look, I'm going to throw some out. Promise not to get mad at Pastor Curry. Being late all the time is not a gift to God. And actually, it shows that you've got too much demonic activity flattening around because you can't get where you need to go where you need to go. Now, that is not to include picking up people and doing all the things you do. You follow what I'm saying? But let's say you got a person that constantly, constantly just can't break free from getting there on time. There's something else there, folks. Take authority over it. Say, oh, me. Now, I'm not picking on that. I've been late. But when it becomes a habit, any habit that doesn't glorify God, listen carefully, is a habit, is a weight you don't need to be involving yourself in. Remember your child of God, he doesn't condemn you. He loves you. But why are we wrapping things around our life that really are taking us nowhere? Okay, say, I got it. Then sin. The word say, everyone say sin. Did you know that there's two kinds of sin? It's all sin. What do you mean, Pastor Kerry? Well, there's a sin, the sin that you and I do when we fall short, when we make mistakes. That's just a sin sin, and God works with us about that. He wants us to help us overcome. But here's something that we have to be cautious about. When we do something wrong in front of everybody... Now you've trespassed, and it's a little bit different. You bring a curse when you do that. Like, for example, let me just paint a scenario. Let's say one of you, God forbid, somebody somewhere despises me in their heart, got the wrong idea about me, and then they start speaking evil stuff. What do you think is going to happen to a person like that? Are they going to be under the blessing or under the curse? Amen. So if you get something, and this is how you know you're under a curse, check yourself. Check yourself every day with God and say, Lord, make sure I'm not complaining. Make sure I'm not speaking against people in the church. God warned us, don't talk about bad about any Christian. It opens a, an area where you can be attacked. Say amen. But a person who gets a blessing, this is how you know you're under the wrong spirit. And remember, we do that to ourselves. A curse does not come causeless. So it comes because we're doing something that we shouldn't. Now remember, God's not cursing us. God's not putting a curse on it. Everyone say amen. amen. We get out from our umbrella. How many of you are out of an umbrella? What happens when you get out from it in your middle of it? You get wet. Oh, buh, 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 buh. Now, I like those umbrellas that go all the way down almost to the ground. You ever seen those? Then they got a little window in them. And that's where the wind blowing sideways and the rain and amen. Well, you're totally covered in a dome, folks. Goes underneath your feet, all the way around your head, like an eggshell of glory. And when you get out of prayer, that's what you're covered in. Now, it's not until we open our mouth and remove all doubt that the enemy knows that isn't Jesus. So learn this. Learn it. You're going to hear it over and over again because there's too many casualties in the body of Christ because they're not applying the word properly. Not because I know it. 
because the word has been given to us for us to be free and liberated. Can you say amen? Oh man, I'm fired up. So it goes on further to say, and let us run with endurance. That's God's patience in us. The race, the life that is set before us, looking unto the problems, looking unto everybody's faults. I want to make sure you're reading along with me. Looking under who? Jesus. Listen, it's so easy for you to notice my faults, and sometimes I do a little fault to see if you're going to do something. I'm a little kind of smart, smart aleck that way. Okay? I want to see, see how you're going to respond to something. Because God is looking for leadership in his children. He's looking for people that are not going to react to the world and react to things, but respond by the power of God. Can you say amen? Seeing that we have this, right? Look at what the rest of the scripture says. It goes on, it says, looking unto the Jesus, the author, he started our faith, and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the Father. I you say amen. Did he see that we were going to be in trouble? Yeah. Did he see a family that he was going to gain? So he looked for the good. You know, when you look at him, everybody has bad. I must discern. I had a guy tell me, I love him so. He says, I've been watching you. You walk around, Carrie, like somebody who walks on water. So I want to make sure I'm always humble. Am I a humble person to you? Okay. Because uh, this is what I said to him. I said, you know, I love you, brother. I says, but maybe I do. Maybe I do walk on water. You don't know. Right? Our job is not to be focusing on people. What a discouraging thing. <laughs> but to focus on Jesus so we can love people. Two commandments. What are they? Love the Lord thy God with your mind, heart, soul, and strength. And love your neighbor as I have loved you. Forget this as, as you love yourself. Part. That's Old Testament. Let me ask you. Have you ever felt unloving towards yourself? Yes. Well, how would you treat your neighbor then? You see how limited it is? An eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. We don't live the Old Testament. We learn from it. I'm going to say it again. We don't live the Old Testament. We learn from it. What do you mean? Listen, I could run around, way, not, there's nothing wrong with this, and do all the feasts and do all that, but you know, I'm going to have no knowledge about what I'm about to tell you because feasts don't teach you the New Testament philosophies of how to walk with Christ. And that's the problem. Satan always keep you in the Old Testament. Start reading your Bible from the beginning all the way to the end. Don't ever read your Bible that way. You start with the book of John. And you find out who Jesus is and why he said, he that has seen me has seen the Father. Study it. Study the book of John. Get to know Jesus like you know yourself. Maybe even better. All right. Say, say we're surrounded. We're blessed. We lay aside anything that slows us down. Now, remember this. Anytime you have something you're working on, you're wrestling with in your life, you never wrestle with it alone. You now have God in you. You say, God, I'm having a hard time with this. Help me with this. Can you do that? Yeah. That's all you need to do. And God says, great, I've been waiting for you to ask. Because there are parts of our life, believe it or not, we have not asked God to come in and really help us with. Don't worry. Just ask God to show you what those are so we can invite God. God cannot trespass your will. So if you're unwilling to, or you're un, unknowledgeable about an area of your life, and it's funny, oftentimes everybody else will show you and point it out to you. But sometimes we're unaware of it to ourselves. We go to God and ask him to help us overcome it. Say amen. You know, God is so smart and so wise. He saved us just like we were, didn't he? He saved us just like we were when we came to him, right? But he's smart enough not to leave us that way. <laughs> You're supposed to be growing and developing. You're supposed to be better today than you were a week ago. Lord, help me, change me, alter me. You know he's a wise master builder. All right, a couple of points I want to give you. Number one, we were and are never alone. Say amen. 
We may feel alone. We may be surrounded with uh, all kinds of emotions. But the Bible says we're surrounded with a great cloud of witnesses. Can you say amen? That means, uh-oh, there's invisible things around you all the time. Amen. Two, it's our job to go to God and ask him to help us lay aside the weight and the sin that so easily trips us up. Three, these are two, there are two areas that we need to concentrate. Notice he said weight and sin, weight and sin. Weight is those things in your life that really God told you, hey, get rid of that. And you're still holding on. Okay, that's a weight. Okay, I defined it a little differently. And the sin just simply means missing the mark. And I told you the two different kinds of sin. One is missing the mark privately where you don't affect anybody. And then there's somebody like a pastor or somebody that's really in front of a lot of people just goes out and commits sin. That's going to affect a lot of people. You see what I'm saying? So I always have a thing that I tell everybody. If you're going to go out and blow it, do it by yourself. <laughs> Come on, laugh with me. Isn't that true? If you're going to go out and have a nasty day, don't let anybody else see that way. You know what it looks like? Folks, I'm going to tell you what my pastor told me. He says, people never look at the good in you. And when they do, it's great. He says, but they really don't seldom look at the good. They measure themselves by looking at you, how you're doing with how they're doing. Completely unscriptural. Okay. And then, and then, as they're measuring and everything like that, you know, the enemy is just working away and it's doing all. Listen, don't measure yourself up with anybody other than Jesus. Because he's the model. He's the chief cornerstone. He's the one that we look at. He's the author and finisher of our faith. He's the first. He's the last. He's the beginning. And, he, and he's the end. So we know our God. Fourthly, the race that is set before us is our life. Now, folks, who are we competing against? A race, there's competition. We're competing against the enemy, keeping us from following God. Very little, though. And our flesh, mostly. Scripture says, if, if you are a soldier, don't entangle yourself. This is in Timothy, but I don't have it as one of my scriptures. It says, if you're a soldier, and we are, don't entangle yourself in the affairs of this life. Hello? How many know the enemies in this life? And he can get you caught up in somebody else's business. Hello? What, did something wrong with <laughs> Also, we got caught up in the country and railing about this and railing about that. Satan was just laughing at us. I'm doing that, you kids. You know, this, your eyes are off of Jesus and you're getting all upset. Well, I got upset too. And you know what God told me? He says, eyes off the world system is passing away. Eyes off of other people, especially if they think they're a know-it-all. <laughs> Folks, we're letting scientists tell us who God is. How dumb is that? They still think we're alone. <laughs> we have been full of visitors in this planet forever. Folks, they're not aliens that are coming. They're fallen angels and demons. They are truly an alien to this planet. But they've dug in here, and so you and Henry say this. This is the truth. They're dug in underground. They're under the ocean. They dug into the prince of the air. He's in the air. So, but he's invisible in another dimension. Now, listen, let me tell you quickly. He's going on a segue. Catch me. These things are only allowed to step into our reality for a moment and then step out. They can't stand the reality you and I live in. And even though it be a fallen dimension, it's still a God dimension. Can you say amen? So there's a curtain, just like you would see in the temple, that literally when people play with Ouija boards and the occult thing, they rip that curtain open just long enough to let a demon come on in and attach it to some to them. That's why you don't play with the occult. That's why you don't play with reading tarot cards. That's why you don't have sexual perversions. These things cause demonic activity. Say on me. So this is a fallen planet, but with godly people in it. We got to follow the shepherd on the way out. Can you say amen? All right. So let's go to our next point.
<laughs> Don't preach myself happy. Now this one here. We are soldiers of the cross. Go with me, please, to Mark chapter 8. And we're going to look at verse 34 to 38. We are soldiers of the cross. Now, folks, what does the cross represent to you? Huh? It represents the death of self and Christ's suffering for you. Jesus is not on the cross anymore, is he? It's just, it's long gone. But he hung on the cross between heaven and hell to pay the price for our salvation and to strip the devil of his authority. Remember, the devil got his authority from Adam. Okay? And he confronted Jesus with it. I'll give you all these nations if you bow down and worship me, he said. Jesus says, get thee behind me, Satan. But the scripture in the Greek says, get thee behind me and keep on going, don't stop. <laughs> I don't want the devil behind me, do you? Anyway, so let's go on. Mark chapter 8, verse 34. And when he had called his people to himself with his disciples, he said to them, Whoever desires to come after me, how many here desire to follow Jesus? Yes. Then what he's about to say is key. If you desire to come after me, let him deny yourself. What is the big thing with our struggles usually during the day is with what? Flesh. Flesh and self. It's just it is. So we go to God and we say, Lord, I throw my flesh down. I ask you to crucify it. So you're daily crucified before God. It won't rise up. When you pick it back up and walk out into your life, it won't fight you as hard. But go ahead two or three days or not showing up at church or just going ahead and living like the world, and it'll start weighing down on you, and you'll find yourself beginning to fail when you should be succeeding. Say amen. amen. All right, so listen to what it says. It goes on. For whoever desires to save his life... That's his selfish life. We'll lose it. But whoever desires to lose his selfish life, will what? And the world. Oh, I, I got to read it again. My eyes are all water. Whoever desires to save his life, lose, will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospel's sake will save it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and lose his own soul? Someone say amen. amen. Or what great, uh, what can he give in exchange for his soul? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and simple generation of him, the Son of Man will be also ashamed. And when he comes into the glory of his Father with his holy angels. Now, what are the angels' job? When Jesus comes to get us, what are the angels' job? To collect people from the four winds of the earth. So they're reapers, they're harvesters. Can you say amen? And they're right there. Did you know you used to have two of them? And they're big, and they're strong, and they're waiting for you to speak the word so they can work with you. They're God's servants, not yours. Say amen. It goes on a couple of points. Number one, Jesus said to his disciples, if any man desire to come after me, we're to do what? What are we to do for to follow Jesus? Deny yourself. How often? All day. Because things are going to pop up. Now, just because you indulge and you want to go get yourself a goodie or a latte, that's not what it's talking about. It's talking about indulging yourself, saying one thing and doing another. Don't tell me you're going to come to church and don't. To me, your life is just a mess and you're trying to hide it. No, don't hide it. When I look at you, I can, you know, when I look at you, especially people that are not serving God, I see exactly where they're at, where they're going, so I can help them. I'll look at somebody, and they'll sit right there, and I'll say, yeah, you can count on me. <laughs> you know, it's really a hard one to deal with sometimes. So let's move on. Two, the natural man, the flesh, has a sinful nature. Remember what we talked about in Bible study? We said there's something about sin that I think we overlook. We know that sin is missing the mark. We know sin is doing the wrong thing. It's a selfish decision that displeases God. But also, what is sin? You know it now. The nature of who? Satan. 
See, people don't see that sin is the nature of Satan. What did Adam and Eve receive when they disobeyed God and ate of the, the, the tree? Received Satan's nature in their flesh. That's why we age and don't live forever. That's why we wrinkle up and we have pimples, God forbid. <laughs> So what do we do? We lay that down because that's not us. This is not us. This is your servant machine. And your servant machine doesn't tell you what to do. Say, oh me. Next time you start to feel not well, instead of letting the machine say, oh, what are you going to do? Take authority over it and get some God in the machine. It's a machine that's living it's made out of carbon-based material. And by the way, we weren't made in a test tube. God pulled us out of the earth and breathed life into us. Can you say amen? amen. All right. For, thirdly, we should have God help us prosper and be in health. Do you believe that? If you want your life more prosperous and being helped, which is God's plan for you, you've got to walk with him a little more and listen to how he instructs you. It's a personal thing for us. Amen. Somebody who lives in divine health is wonderful. So let me give you this. How many know there's divine healing? Yes. How many know there's divine health? That's where you don't get sick and healed, that sick and healed. You get, you're, you're healthier. And then as you continue to walk with Jesus, then there's divine life. There's 30, 60, 100 fold. So the whole idea behind the enemy is to keep you from being consistent and to get you to look around and say, oh, and measure yourself with everybody else. You see the trickery in that? No, your focus is on Jesus. He's the completer of you. As you're focusing on him, he's working all that stuff out. Please, let's try to get out of the way. <laughs> My pastor told me, he says, son, I want to tell you something. I said, what, what's that? His name was Alan Sire. He's a wonderful man. He said, in our prayers, one of the things we don't realize is when we're praying, we're getting ourselves out of the way so God can answer. And so when you're praying and it's all me, me, and I need, and I need that, you're not in, out of the way. So you lay yourself down at God and say, I'm out of the way for whatever you want to instruct me for the day and help guide my steps through the way. Can you say amen? He wants to do that for us, but we have to keep that weight and sin away from us. So it's our job to put it aside. Can you say amen? amen. Finally, in Mark 10, listen to this. Remember the story of the rich man? He came to Jesus. He was a Jewish rich man. He was a young man. Came to Jesus. He said, what must I do to be saved? And Je I'm paraphrasing. And Jesus says, how do you read the law? Because Jews read the law. He says, to love your mother and father. Do not covet. On and on. He went through. But he, he left a couple out. And Jesus says, all these things are good and wonderful. But there are a couple of things you lack. See, that's why people, I think, people don't ask God, what am I lacking? And show me God, because he wants to make up the difference. But we're afraid to see our lack. Folks, you look at it all day long. We look at our lack. Don't focus on it. How many years still could use some more blessings? Yeah. Right. Those blessings are not negative. They're powerful. You don't want to curse. You want to get a brand new toy, and because your life is so terrible, the thing breaks down, you can't keep it running. Life, family, that's exactly how to bring a curse, is go ahead and start doing things that you think you can get away with, and you'll bring a curse on yourself, and even the blessings of God will turn sour. Read it, Deuteronomy 28. It shows us to avoid the curses at all costs. All right, so look what it said, Mark 10. Now as he was going out on the road, there came one running and kneeling before him. He was excited and asked him, good teacher, what shall I do to have eternal life? I told you most of the story, but it goes down in verse 20. And he answered him and said, teacher, all these things I've kept from my youth because I'm Jew. Okay. Then Jesus looking at him did what? Loved him because he was blowing it. Oh, where was he blowing it? And so they looked at him and loved him and said to him, one thing you lack, go your way. Now listen, I'm going to explain. 
Go your way, sell whatever has you, oops, that you have, and give it to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come, take up your cross, and follow me. Now, how many know the riches don't get us to heaven? Riches don't make us a whole lot. And it's fact that riches sometimes try to control us. God wants us wealthy. He wants us prosperous and healthy. So don't ever forget that. But he doesn't want any sorrow added to it. He doesn't want you to suffer with it. When he gives you something, there's no curse to it. Hello? It's all good. All perfect. But what happens is we heap it upon ourselves. God give you a $5,000 check and immediately you spend it all on yourself. What a doof. Some of that belongs to God so he can continue to bless you. You just cut your throat. My pastor said, don't ever spend your last dollar on yourself. Don't ever do it. Give it away. Because it's seed money that gets you more. We don't think. We just kind of lumber along and praise the Lord. No. You should think. If you're a farmer, a rancher, you're planting crops, you think it all out. You lay it out. You know what you're going to do. You know where the seeds are going to go. How about our Christianity? Let God lay it out for you. Say amen. amen. Let's go to the next one. We fight from the command center. Go with me to Hebrews chapter 4, please. 14 through 16. Folks, when we say, Father, in the name of Jesus, what happens? I've taught you long enough. You're covered with who? I'll speak it. It's Hebrews chapter 4, okay? 14 through 16, I think. When we say, Father, in the name of Jesus, what happens? I can't hear you. You get completely covered with God, and you are taken up into the command center. Now, if you get a chance and you want a little adventure, let me encourage you to read some of the book of Enoch. Enoch was taken up into the command centers and shown things. Well, I don't know if that's true or not. Well, so you just keep on doubting. Because, you know, when I pray for you, I actually come to your house. And I sit with you and pray when I'm in the spirit. God moves me right there. When I'm praying for your children and things like that, God moves me. I have a lady. I'm a watchman over Montana. God gave me the, the anointing and the power to watch over the works that are going in that particular shared and stuff. And I believe Scott's involved in that. But as a watchman, I'm not in charge. I'm watching in prayer. See, watchman watches in prayer, sees what's going on and what's coming and prays against it, warns the people that need to be warned. You follow, you're a watchman. If you pray, you're an intercessor, you're a watchman. You're watching out so you bring the glory of God into areas sometimes that don't know. Say amen. amen. Cities, BJ. Amen. So you think about that. But we fight from our command center. Folks, get a vision of this. Can the devil go up to the command center? No. Can he walk in there and listen into your prayers? No. But you ask 60% of the body of Christ thinks the devil hears their prayers. No. It's not true. Who's teaching those, little, those people? Religious. I watched. I went... A couple of years back, I went to a fair while we were having fairs before COVID, and a bunch of pastors and works were having little meetings and everything. So I went and interviewed the pastors. I like to interview pastors because a pastor has a certain call, has certain things that he has to manifest to be actually a pastor. You know, he has to care for his flock. He has to love people. Can you say amen? And he has to esteem there very highly for God's sake. Can you say amen? Otherwise, you're not a pastor. It might be something else, but you're not a pastor. So I interviewed, I'm so amazed that God's people are getting anything that's worth anything. They get a good song service. They get a good 15 minutes of do this, do this, do this. God be with you and see you later. The churches are packed because the devil doesn't fight them. He just lets people go because they're not going to get hardly anything. Don't shout me down because you know I'm right. Yeah. They become big nurseries for adults. Yeah. And it's not right. right. 
We are not going to be that way. We're going to be God people, God followers, God people that know God. And when somebody asks us a question, we can give some kind of residential answer that's going to make some kind of sense. Man. And God is grieved in some areas because he needs his people ready. This is the end time harvest. We rule this planet, folks, under Christ. Did you know that? Yes. Jesus Christ came, stripped the devil, made a mess of him. All he can do is con. And because humans are weak-willed, they don't know how to resist, submit to God, resist the devil, he will flee. And they're open, and whatever comes, and so we need to shut that down. Can you say amen? He has but a short time, but this planet now belongs to you and I. God gave it through Christ back to us. The church, not people. Because you can see what people have done to the planet with Satan's suggestions. But he gave the planet back to the church. Maybe you didn't know that. So the church actually rules under God in the planet. I shared with uh, my little Sherry, uh, I call her little Sherry, and I call her Sherry L, Sherry O, so that's what we say, but she's shorter. Anyway, I, I told her, I says, you need to know what Kratos and, and Iskus is. Kratos is arresting the situation, walking in on the scene and taking over. Did Jesus ever do that? You bet he did. I told you about the officer I talked to that was you and using the languages and, and looking like a real screwball. You know, I walked up to him. I said, you got a badge on you, don't you? He says, yeah. I said, that's impressive. I love that. But this F and F and F and coming out of your mouth, you completely neutralize it in my eyes. You need to do something about that. You know, I'm talking to a, an officer. What did I do? I arrested the situation and I stepped in the scene to share Jesus with him. Guess what? He had just started going to Bible study and just gave his heart to the Lord. He hadn't been cleaned up yet. And guess what? I walked in at the right time, made the right statement. Now that's crazy! But you have the authority in Christ to arrest the situation. Walk on. Listen, here's a word. You've got your grandkids playing in games and, and doing things and doing soccer and stuff, and you're there at the game. Don't let them play without praying over them. Okay. Put your hands on. Come on, little ones. You're, no injuries today. You see? Why don't we do that? Because we're not as, as quite trained yet, but we're going. Can you, we're getting there. Can you say amen? So we're, we rule and command this planet from the throne room of God. Why do we go to pray anyway? To ask in behalf of others. Can you imagine one of the greatest expressions of love is intercessory prayer. Everyone say intercessory prayer. That's standing in the gap for someone else that doesn't know how to pray. You have the ability to bring God on the behalf of someone else who hasn't even asked for God to be involved in their life. That's how much jurisdiction you have. Well, what if they don't receive? That's not your business to know. You send God on them anyway. We're here to send God on people to preach the gospel of the good news of Jesus Christ. We're not here to run around correct people, run around tell what everything is wrong. Our job is to be a shining light of excellence, moving in the power of God. Someone say amen. amen. That's who you are. That's who you are. Not, no, I wish I was that way. You keep talking like that, you'll never be that way. You're a champion, but you got to go to the champion maker on a daily basis. Are you with me? All right. So Hebrews 4, verse 14 through 16 says, Seeing then that we have a great high priest, who's that? Jesus, who has passed through the heavens. See, that phrase, you've got to know that Jesus is the only one who left this planet first. When it says he passed through the heavens, who is the prince of the heavens in, in the atmosphere? Satan is. Jesus just stomped right on through. And he said he led captivity captive. You've got to understand, because of that, listen to what else he says. Because of this very thing, let us hold fast the confession of our faith. For we do not have a high priest, Jesus, who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but it was in all points tempted like we are, yet without sin. Say amen. amen. 
Look what it says now. I got the hiccups. I got to take a break. <laughs> what do we do? Are to do now, folks? Let us come what boldly before the throne of grace to obtain what you need. Can you say amen? amen. We don't fight from the planet. We go, Father, in Jesus' name, he closes us and brings us up to the command center. Then God says, okay, what do you want? I'm ready here. Now, what we don't understand is, was Satan born in this planet? So he has really no authority here, right? But you were born in this planet, weren't you? So let me clarify. People that are not born in this planet are thieves and robbers. That's Satan and his bunch. Okay? Now, he stole the authority from Adam. He usurped Adam's authority, took his birthright. But Jesus came and gave it back. And now it has to be a born-again believer who is in charge. Now, think about the born-again believers. How much do they really know that they're in charge? How much do you think they really know how to pray? Now you know why the devil's working so hard on the church. Keep us ignorant, inactive. Sit around and wait until Jesus gets it all together for us, and then he'll whisk us away. No, nonsense. You're to be in training. You're to learn. You're to ask and cry out to God for him to teach and, and train you how to operate and function in harmony with the kingdom of heaven. Someone say amen. amen. So we reign from the throne room in our prayer. We don't get involved in the nastiness of fighting the devil face on. Folks, you don't swing at the devil with the words of your mouth. You're not like Paul says, I beat the ear. Here's what you do. You go, Father, in Jesus' name, anoint my lips and guide my prayers. Now your prayers are the sword of the Spirit, the lightsaber sword of the Spirit, because the Word is God, God is light. Speaking the Word from your Spirit is a weapon. In heaven, in the spiritual realm of the throne of God, you reign. For we all reign in life in one Christ Jesus, Romans 8. I think it's verse 8. Are you getting anything out of this? Yes. Okay, get this, because this is who you are. Satan doesn't want you in the throne room. He wants you so upset, this, that, and so caught up with the affairs of the world, you can't stay in the throne room and get anything done. So say, not me. I love God. I hang out with him. Well, does the throne room always have to be up in heaven? No, it's everywhere you go when you're in communication with God. You have a movable tent throne room. Hello. Now, I have a special spot where I always meet with God, but I don't stop there. My car is a throne room. Yeah. While I'm driving along, I'm praying along. Yeah. I find out that if I'm going to hang around with God, Satan's lost. Yeah. He has no way. Of, he's going to get anywhere near me. Now, if I shut down, don't pray, get all negative, blah, 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 blah. We're going to be easy pickings, chickens. Hello? You'll get plucked, guaranteed. And we don't want that. Say amen. Yeah. I've done preach myself happy. So, so seeing that we have that great high priest, let's go on. For we do not have a high priest that can't understand how we feel. So don't tell him all the time how you feel. Tell him the word so he can fix how you feel. Let us therefore come boldly. Ephesians 2, I love what it says, verse 4 through 6. It says, but God who is rich in mercy because he, of his great love wherewith he loved us. Now listen, verse 5. Even when we were dead in trespasses and sin, made us alive together with Christ. And now we are sitting with him and where? In heavenly places. You see, you're in God's command center. We don't think we are because we're conscious of where we're at here, but we're also dwelling in the command center, which means that you can move heaven and earth. Now, folks, what we don't realize, prayer is getting us out of the way and then inviting God in to take over. Getting us out of the way by laying ourselves down and then asking God to take over in an area. Lord, I pray for Scott. I thank you, Lord, that you will help him in his future. I'm just giving an example. And that his family, they will help them always be thoughtful of God. Lord, I release their angels in case they bound. And you become creative because you're in the command center. 
Worst thing you can do is get up before God and go, oh, well, this is really cool. And that's where half the body of Christ has been. This is really cool. I feel goosebumps. You know, I can shoot sparks out of my fingers. So what do you think? And Scott's actually seen it. Come on now. Yeah. Come on now. Yeah, yeah. And look at, look at, I love you so much, but how many of you are doctors and lawyers and, and you're around and travel around the world? Let's get some of them in here and hear this message so they can get it out. Yeah. Satan doesn't want people coming to this church. Right. Can you understand why now? Yes, yes. So help me. Invite. I'm trying. Well, you're doing great. <laughs> I'm trying to tell them. <laughs> It's okay. You're doing one. We're all doing wonderful. I'm always doing. Yeah. But see, here's the thing. As you invite, God's anointing goes with you. So if they're resisting God, then they might say yes, but they don't. Don't worry about that. Just keep it on. Keep loving and caring. Pretty soon God will go right on through. And they'll go, you know what? I want to come to church with you today. You see, now you're not coercing, kind of. God is beckoning us. And I've always prayed. My wife, my wife will bear witness to this. God, let me preach and teach. Now, this is for me, okay? Preach and teach in such a way that it causes a hunger in your people that hear and want to know you better. Just can't stand it, but they want to get to know you better. That's what I want my preaching to do. I don't want to dazzle you with information, tell you how much I know, because I could do that too. But that isn't going to cause you to want to hunger for God and really desire for God. Can you say amen? Yeah. So everyone says, I am privileged to dwell in the command center of God. He needs my authority, listen, on this planet as a person born here to continue to invite him in behalf of others. Now you see he needs for us to ask him because he doesn't bypass the thing he gave. He said, Peggy, I give you authority over the fish of the sea, the fowl of the air, all the things. The earth is yours. Now invite me to get involved. That's where God is at. Hello? Yeah. And if you get somebody like Linda back there who's been praying for her family for years and years, his, her family hasn't got a chance. <laughs> because what all that mountain up prayer is working together for their good to get them saved. Amen. I always do it this way. Lord, you know how to reach so-and-so. I don't know how to reach them. So go in there and do what you do best. You pray like that and see the results. That's for you, sister. You got family that you want God to do the best for you. It's going to happen to you for Pauline. Woo! Thank you, God. I just get all excited about this stuff. All right. So we found out that we rule and reign from the command center, don't we? All right. Well, let's talk about our hedge, and then we're running out of time. Oh, wow, God is good. Rebuilding the hedge of protection. Go with me to Philippians chapter 4, please. Verses 4 through 9, very familiar, 4 through 8, excuse me, 4 through 8. Um, a very familiar scripture, but this is how to maintain your hedge, okay? Everyone say, maintain my hedge. Now, remember I told you that when you were born, you had a hedge about you. But when we got a little older, we ripped it down because we didn't know why. And then we got born again, and then hedge is put right back around us. That's that incubation time when you first got saved. Nothing, you could do nothing wrong. It just seemed everything was happy when you first got saved. Then all of a sudden things changed. That was that incubation time that God gave you. But he's got a hedge about you. Now here's what happened. When you and I speak contrary to the word, we chisel away our hedge. When you and I don't pray, our hedge can't grow. So your prayer builds your hedge back up again. Say amen. So lack of prayer, you're going to have very little hedge and you're going to have more trials and temptations than normal. As you pray and as you submit to God and love God and let God, he rebuilds your hedge through your prayers and pretty soon you'll find the enemy not getting in, not able to do some of the stuff that he used to do all the time. Hello, anybody experiencing that? Oh, yeah. yeah, I love that. You mean to tell me, Pastor Kerry, there's hope for us? <laughs> hope for all of us, amen. I got to take a swig. I didn't get a chance to eat my breakfast this morning, so 
Ah, I gotta have some substance. All right, rebuilding the hedge, Philippians 4, look at verse 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. Why? Rejoicing in God. Now listen to me carefully. Simple thing, okay, because it keeps the waters moving. Thank you, Lord. Oh, I'm so happy. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. And yet you got stuff over here going wrong. I thank you, God. I appreciate it. Why? Because the bubbles that keeps the water moving in you, you're filled with spiritual water. And when the water sits, you're going to get stale. Dale. You keep the water bubbling. Hello? Yeah. And you do that by meeting with God on a daily basis. Say Amen. Okay, rejoice always. Again, I say rejoice. Let your gentleness, not your anger, not you being right, that you're a humble, gentle person, be known to all men. Say amen. It's the humble that usually get her done. Because they don't brag, they don't do anything, they don't have extra fights. Humble people get exalted. Yeah. You, you exalt yourself and you become humbled. Amen. And you'll, you'll embarrass yourself. And we don't want that to happen to you. All right. It goes on further to say, be anxious for nothing. How much? Anxious means don't worry about a thing. Anxious. Have you ever felt yourself anxious? Oh, yeah. Sure. Who do you think is bringing that feeling? Not your thoughts. The enemy is. Then your thoughts go. As soon as you start feeling anxious, then your mind kicks in. Let me tell you, I wonder what's going on with me. Yeah. I wonder what's going on with me. And the devil says, hey, I got a few suggestions. <laughs> you're this, you're that, you got this, you got that. Self-analyzation is not what God wants you to do. He wants you to trust him and let him show you. Say amen. amen. Tough one to learn. So let's go on. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, through prayer. How much? Folks, this is about your hedge. If you don't pray about things, you're going to rip a hole in your hedge. That car you went out and bought, you didn't bother to take somebody with you who knows more than you. You ran out there because you're so pleased you can do this. You're ripping a hole in your hedge, Bunky. Don't do that. Go get the people, submit to God, say, God, help me with this. Then the hedge remains. You don't rip it down with pride, thinking you're all that. Say, oh, me, everybody. Oh, no, oh, me, everybody. <laughs> there you go. All right, so I'm just talking to you. I'm telling you, through years of training, please pay attention to what I'm telling you, because it will show in your life who you're listening to by how much goofball stuff's going on. We don't want to hear the truth. You're picking on me. No, I'd rather pick on you before the devil does. But I don't pick on you. I'm just sharing truth. Okay, go on. He says, all things through prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. What is supplication? Anybody here know what supplication means? Have you ever been in front of a store and seen somebody petitioning? Supplication means to petition the Lord. Lord, your word says you would save my household. Therefore, in Jesus' name, I petition you. That's how you do that. Lord, I have a petition near you. Your promise says that if I obey you, you will, I will taste and eat the good of the land. Lord, this is what your petition says. Now, you, see, so you, when you're with God, it's very professional, but very pure. This is my request and my petition. Well, doesn't he know before you ask? Yes, he does. But unless you ask, you ain't going to get it. <laughs> you have not because you. So once we know that principle works, then we need to ask and ask a lot. Because you're the one that's without. Now, you, things might be picking up and going good and everything. But we're still without because our, some of our family's not saved. Some of our loved ones, some of our friends. Hello. So, you know, we're not done. We're having fun. We're dwelling in the command center of God. We're building our hedge. Can you say amen? amen. So let's look at it. Finally, 
We're not to be anxious, all things through prayer and supplication. Then the peace of God that surpasses your understanding will guard, there's your hedge, your heart and mind. There's your hedge. It guards your heart and mind. Now, if you read anything about the vineyards of old, they would put a hedge around the vineyard to keep the wolves and everything from eating of the vine. God put a hedge around you, and we tear it down or build it up by either prayer or lack thereof. Someone say, oh, me. Now you know that, hey, you can't be running around blaming me for your faults. I didn't do that to you. Oh, yeah, but you did this and you did that. Hey, Adam, wasn't the wife that God gave you? You're blaming everybody else? You say, I made a mistake. Forgive me, and God will fix the problem. But if you can't say, I made a mistake, I did this, I did this without consulting you, and all that kind of, then you're still in error. And you're still, the hedge has holes in it. How many here would have the devil, if he came against you, the hedge would rip him apart? That's just a protective thing. You got a sword, you got a helmet, you got a breastplate, you got a peach shot, you got all this stuff, and you got a hedge about you. Well, how come the enemy's getting in? I wonder why. Come on now, I'm kidding with you. Our mouth, our resentments. Remember David, uh, remember King Saul's daughter, David's first wife? Do you remember her name was Michiel? Everyone say Michiel and don't spit on your neighbor. <laughs> she was Saul's daughter and she was a despiser and a complainer. And every time David would get happy, she would despise him in her heart. The Bible says because of her being that way, she brought a curse upon her and she would never have children. See, that's why you need to know your Bible and take these little lessons. See, we're to learn from their lessons, not from going repeating it. Hello. Don't despise anybody in your heart. Give it to God and say, Lord, I don't understand and it doesn't feel good. But you take it. Say amen. So we're not polluted. I don't know about you. This pure water right here, ah, it tastes good. Taste it with me. Then Peggy comes along and puts a little horse manure in there. Still the same flavor, but has a little extra substance. What do you think the devil does? He tries to lace things in your mind and get your bait and switch a going. Don't look over here. Look over here. It isn't really you and all the dumb stuff you're doing. It's the pastor's fault. You see, I'm just saying, I know you guys love me and there isn't any blaming the pastor here, but I'm, use me for example because I know there isn't. When somebody says, you know, we went out for lunch. I says, well, what'd you have? Pastor. Oh, God, I'm really not going to go on to that. All right, now. Come on, laugh. We're learning the word together. We're understanding who we really are in God. So you don't have to need to be somebody. You are somebody. Satan is trying to hide it from you. That's why he's blinded the minds of them that believe not. And we still suffer from doubt, all of us. we got to wash it out of our head. All right. Amen. Finally, whatever is good, whatever is perfect, whatever is just, whatever is holy, you're to think about those things and not all the other stuff. Say amen. One more scripture and we'll show you about the hedge. Go with me to Job chapter 1, the book of Job. Now, how much do you know about the book of Job? Let me give you a couple of things. It's the oldest book, scripture, scriptural scroll in the Bible. Okay, first one they found. Can you say Amen. It tells about only nine months of, of Job's life. It's not talking about his entire life. It's talking about the first nine months of an incident that happened that all hell broke loose on Job. It's not talking about his entire life. Because we know if you read the end of the book, he gets twice as much as when he first began. But he's talking about what the enemy did to him. Now we have this story. If you've been told that God, Satan went up into heaven and accused Job, you're correct. But if you were told that God turned Job over to the devil, you were mistaught. It's not accurate, and some of the newer translations are inaccurate. 
No, God did not turn him over. He simply said, he's in your hands. In other words, Job was doing something that ripped his hedge down. Are you getting this? He's ripping his own hedge down. Married an unsaved woman because she was probably a fox. <laughs> Don't shout me down because I'm reality. And his children, she taught, a worldly woman taught her children how to party, to drink. I mean, here's a statement. Some friends of mine went up camping, and they were up in the Snoqualmie, and they're next door to a man, and they wanted to visit with the campers. And so he came right over and says, how are you doing? We're just are your neighbors and being happy and stuff. And he says, I'm not doing well. I came up here to die. I got cancer and a few more months to live. I came up here to die. He says, oh, we're going to pray for you. Let's God have pray for you. And this is what the guy said. You know, there was somebody in your space two days ago that said they were a Christian. And they were drinking and cussing and smoking pot. And when I told them I needed prayer, they came over just like they were holy and prayed over me. You know, and I'm thinking, is this what Christianity is all about? And, and, of course, this person says, no, this is not, this is, that's not right. That's what we call the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. Everyone say doctrine? Teaching of the Nicolaitans. They taught that you can be a Christian, do whatever you want, you're still saved. Now, how many know that's not true? Because you can't lie and cheat and, and still maintain Okay, now listen, it's not what goes in a man to defile it. So in the eyes of that person, he thought every Christian was just simply like the world. But no, when they prayed for him, he got touched because they don't live a compromised life. Remember the battery poles, positive and negative? You live a compromised life, they cross, and you won't have any juice, no power. You will short out, and your life will be a failure. So don't mix the world with your walk. Notice I'm pausing. Because doing that, even though, hey, even though we can enjoy stuff, don't you step out from your umbrella. Don't you move out from your hedge. Everyone say, I got a hedge about me. It. it follows me and surrounds me everywhere I go on this planet. So when you go to work, you got that hedge around you. And when you go to visit friends, you got that hedge about you. That hedge is to protect you. So beyond anything else, you're going to really be, make sure what you say and how you talk is good and won't rip your hedge down. Say amen. amen. That you don't become your own worst enemy. All right, almost done with you. My word. <laughs> Job chapter 1, verse 8. Now there was a day when the sons of God, everyone say sons of God. These are angels. They are not the daughters of Cain's kids. These are fallen angels. The Greek word, or excuse me, the Hebrew word is bene ha Elohim. Everyone say bene ha Elohim. It means angels. They remember they're an Elohim, but they're a little lower than God. How many gods are there? One God in three persons. The first three Elohim, the rest are copies. All the angels, all the things that we see in the scripture, they're all servants of God, but you are a child of God. That's the only difference. Satan didn't like that, did he? Very jealous fella. I'm smelling smoke, devil. <laughs> I'm smelling smoke, Satan. In Jesus' name. Aren't you afraid to say that? No. Because he has to get through Christ, through God, through the Holy Spirit, through the angels, to even get close to me. Unless I step out from the umbrella, and I get out from my hedge, or I rip such a hole in it by yelling at my husband. Get that repaired right away. That's why we ask for forgiveness when we do something wrong right away. So the hedge comes back up. See, oh yeah, that's why. Confess your faults. Confess your sin. Build the hedge back up. Okay, and finishing. So Job, they came in and presented themselves. And, okay, and came to present themselves before the Lord. And Satan came in amongst them. I thought God threw Satan out of heaven. 
When did God throw Satan out of heaven? Before the creation of Adam and Eve. So what's he doing back into heaven? If God threw him out of heaven, is he thrown out? How did he get back up with the rest of the angels presenting himself? Adam's authority. Adam gave the planet to him, so now Satan has a planet to get back into heaven. God can't do a thing about it. And so it says it was so affected that the throne of room of God was affected. It had to be cleansed because Satan came up on Adam's authority and waggled his daggle. Hello. And said, from walking to and fro in the earth, which Adam gave me. Do you see? Yeah. So how did he get back in there? He got through Adam's authority. What did God do when Jesus came? Jesus came and stripped him and cast him back out of heaven. That's why he says, and I behold Satan fall from lightning. He cast him back out and gave the planet back to you and I, the church, not just humans. Because humans without Jesus serve a different God. Your dentist, when he's looking at you, you know, <laughs> you ask him if he's saved. You're going to drill on me? You better know Jesus. <laughs> I'm kidding with you. Woo! Man, the power of God's on me. So, so it says, look, so he said to Satan, where are you coming from? And Satan answered, he says, from going to and fro in the earth and from walking back and forth in it. Then the Lord said to Satan, have you considered, set your eyes to devour my servant Job? That's the word consider. Is there is none like him in all the earth, a blameless, an upright man who fears God and hates evil. Now, Job is in real big trouble, but what is God saying about Job? You notice Job did not pick on any of his faults. God did not say Job is a mess. Job's already in your power. Job's this, Job's that. God never talks about his children in any negative way. Everyone smile. This is my God loves me. He brags on you, matter of fact. That's why we need to get with it. We have something he can brag about. He am not us. Okay, so... When was Satan kicked out of heaven? Before the creation of Adam and Eve. How did he get there? You already answered that. What are you going to do in a place where it says the evil spirits left the presence of the Lord and went to Saul? God doesn't have any evil spirits to send to Saul. But Satan, remember, he got up on Adam's authority. So Satan was coming in on a regular basis and, and mouthing off in front of God on Adam's authority. That's why Jesus came. Stripped him of it. Now, Satan cannot leave the planet now. He's not out there flying around in spaceships. Hello? And there's no aliens visiting us. And I know to tell you that. Because there's probably life somewhere else. I know heaven's a planet, but they're not visiting us. Why? Because we're hostile. We kill things we don't understand. We're a demonic driven warlike society who wants to come and say peace. <laughs> and what is the message these aliens are telling us? Keep the planet clean and let us rule the planet for you. Yeah, the message, the message is, we want to rule the planet, you'll be subservient to us. Who does that sound like? I actually got an interview by the government, snuck into me, of, an, of a demonic spirit, looks like an alien, telling everybody what the real gospel is. I made up God. God is not real. We made it to give the human beings for a religious release. And you see, it's like a little spirit looks like a little eight, gray alien talking to you. Did I send you that clip? Pretty, uh, yeah, I sent him a clip of it. You got to realize your pastor has great connections to things that I can't talk about. And I'm willing to tell you the truth about some of these things as long as you don't become religious about them. There is something flying up there. They've been going along since cavemen. Folks, how about these Neanderthals and all these things, bones that they're finding? These are Satan trying to make mankind replace Adam. 
He's trying to make hybrids. What do you mean? Look at Genesis 6, where the sons of God fell and had sex with men and produced an offspring called the Nephilim, and God had to destroy the planet for it. Now, don't forget those things. Wow. This is nothing. I haven't be this is still Sunday school. So you got to know that your key man is God. And to be with him, inseparable. You're married, God must be the center of your Christianity and your marriage. Yes. Holding both partners together. Yes. Us to be the center of our country, our family, all those things. Yeah. So now, did you learn anything today? Yeah. You, I didn't bore you, did I? No. So now you know you rule and reign through the command center. The command center is God's center. Yes. Okay, now listen. You do it with God. So say, I'm a mountain mover. I'm a sin defacer. I'm a devil chaser. Overcoming child of God. Would you give the Lord a praise? Amen.